our next guest. You've probably read his work in The Nation or Rolling Stone or in book form. If not, you really ought to get out more. William Grider, for 35 years, he has been one of our leading voices on that intersection of politics, economics, and common sense that is so important and so rarely covered. Bill, thanks for joining us again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, always a pleasure. And 35 years. What's that in dog years? <laughs> Sorry. It's actually that. more. Yeah, I, I can tell this to you because nobody else would believe it. It's actually closer to 50 years. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm still going. I started young and I'm well, still playing boy reporter. <laughs> as the twig is bent. Um, so uh, good for you. And listen, uh, before we get into the uh, a couple of things you had to say about uh, the economic platforms of uh, our current and prospective Democratic presidents, uh, it, quick aside, this was the week of uh, the Israeli election, as everyone knows, and you did a piece, Common Sense, uh, yet never mentioned, uh, we, we hear a lot of talk about, understandably, about how the children in Israel and the Middle East should not have to grow up under the shadow of an Iranian nuclear bomb. Perfectly understandable. But, but you asked the question, I certainly agree, but you asked the question, what about Israel's nuclear bomb? Yeah, they don't talk about Israel's bomb. <laughs> yeah, you tried to get into that. It doesn't that, you know, officially exist. It's only, it's only everybody knows about it, but it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist, but even the New York Times back in the day, I recall, reported the the evidence of testing, and the Israelis didn't deny it, and you yeah. know it was it's yeah. all pretty much a wink and a nod and understood. But I would think that if you really, for example, wanted to discourage uh, the nuclear ambitions of Iranians, for example, you might want to do it bilaterally, as was uh, the subject of discussions in the Cold War. Is that too yeah. radical a thought? No, and I, I'm, I'm tempted to, to uh, well, let's break some news here. I, okay. I am literally uh, off of that piece I wrote, which was posted on The Nation, oh, a week and a half, two weeks ago. And basically, I had a very simple point, which is, you, how can you discuss the actual conflicts and politics of the, of the Middle East, and especially whether Iran will or will not get a bomb of its own, without at least mentioning the existence of, of Israel's nuclear arsenal. Right. And, um, and some people would say, well, that's, you know, everybody knows that. And I, I've needled reporters from time to time, <laughs> not, not with animosity toward Israel, but simply it doesn't make sense to just discuss this as an isolated possibility. After that piece appeared, and it got pretty good traffic on the web, um, I got a call from a friend who said, check out this and this and this. And it turns out that um, the Pentagon, quite reluctantly, under pressure from a, from a FOIA lawsuit, has just a re released a, a research report done in 1987 by the defense. Uh, it's, the, it's the Institute of Defense Analyses, which is a Pentagon funding think tank, virtually stating that, of course, Israel has a bomb. It doesn't say it quite that bluntly, but um, I'm, I'm literally right now writing a piece, which will be a, a new blog, I hope, up in the next day or so, uh, describing that report, and it's, 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 it's fascinating. I, it, it's a funny kind of uh, revelation because it, it is not news. It, it, it is true. Right. Uh, the authorities have known this for 40 or 50 years, and Israel adopted a policy of sort of purposeful ambiguity, neither confirming nor denying, etc., but meanwhile proceeding. And so I, I, I have got a copy of the report. It's, it has literally been made available to the public, although they're not putting, you know, posters up <laughs> to get readers. Right. And it's a fascinating document on many levels. I was most struck by the tone of, of, of um, admiration and collegiality between uh, the U.S. defense arms uh, industry and the government strategies, etc., and Israel's. And, and, and maybe it's just because of my ignorance, but uh, Israel was a, a really able partner with 
the Pentagon in developing the new generations of of uh, not just weapons but technologies that are now with us uh, today in in both civil and military forms and and so i i don't want to give away my whole story here but but you know people should check it out it, the, the report is called critic assessment of critical technologies in in uh, in israel and nato uh, nato nations something very much like that you can find it on the web i think so the Israeli uh, we- weapons program, in effect, is an extension of the Defense Department's. And it, yes, and and more than that, the report hints at, without saying too bluntly, that the Israeli program is. A, I think they use the word extrapolation of, of the U.S., <laughs> which is, of course, what people have fought and felt for years and years. What what grabbed me most, however, was the tone of uh, of, of the co- of cooperative searches here, but also that they clearly, um, on, in many, not, I, I don't want to exaggerate this, but I don't think it's right to say Israel was just a junior partner who benefited off the U.S. because Israel brought its own um, very uh, smart and, and, and uh, imaginative scientists and physicists and engineers and so forth. And they, the report says in a couple of uh, places that uh, Gee, they came up with this ingenious solution to X, Y, Z, <laughs> and so um, I'm, I'm trying to capture this with, without being unfair to anybody. I, it's, I'm not doing it as a sort of scary revelation, but it does have uh, political overtones, which are quite, you know, relevant to our moment right now. And you can guess what they are. I mean, well, of course, and, and it suggests we're talking with William Grider about uh, Israel and Israel's defense program and we- weapons program. It suggests that, uh, you know, a lot of people have felt that the U.S. government has become increasingly passive and the threat of uh, Israeli resistance, especially under Netanyahu, to a two-state solution, etc., 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 and it may shed a little light on that if, in fact, one of the benefits of U.S.-Israeli relationship is that it's a good place to experiment or develop new weapons technologies. There's commonality of interest. There may be. Yep. Uh, so I'm very interested in in reading what you have to say about it. And in terms of the nuclear issue, in terms of uh, this this open secret of the Israeli bomb. Uh, as long as everybody with a wink and a nod uh, uh, pretends that it's a secret, it prevents the U.S., I would think, from having to uh, address this diplomatically in some way. And I'm wondering that, if no, exposure that, of this report will force uh, some sort of uh, uh, direct discussion of this issue and perhaps a shift in no, some diplomatic positions. That's, a, that's a, a very valuable insight, and I hope it occurs to the other members of the four, so-called fourth estate, because, as you know, they've been absolutely, not totally, but, but mostly silent. And they certainly haven't addressed, the only, the only exception I've come across is uh, Walter Pincus, who's an old soldier at the Washington Post, where I was a reporter many years ago, and he, he is a, he's a digger, and he, he, he looks for the facts that nobody else is facing and writes about them. And he had a column, not about this reporter, about the... Well, he did... He, what he said was, shouldn't... You know, he said pretty much close to what I was saying, which is, well, while we're arguing over Iran's bomb, don't forget that <laughs> Israel's been down that road already, and he didn't push the implications too far. But, but on the whole, there are a lot of, of contradictions... Uh, that are now visible and and I hope will be addressed. I, I, if the if the past is still in play, people will ignore them and the press will go on to other things once they get tired of beating up on Iran. But um, the, the the little think tank uh, uh, called the what is it called the the Institute for Research Middle East Policy uh, is pushing the several. Uh, provocative notions off of the, they they did the the freedom of information lawsuit that that forced this this release and one of them is hey the US foreign assistance act says we will not give foreign aid to any nation that is trying to develop its own bomb hmm. 
that's and interesting. They say, and if they, these, these amendments were adopted in the '60s, when 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 uh, U.S. politicians were visibly quite concerned about does Israel have the bomb, etc. Uh, and I think that that push came from some liberal uh, senators, but it, it it's still in the law. These people tell me I haven't looked it up, but. Um, and we all know we nobody has to hold, catch their breath. We all know they're not going to cut foreign aid off to Israel, nor do, nor do I propose that. But I think it's an interesting question, isn't it? Well, it's, and, it and is other, an interesting. The other angle I would put on this, William Greider, is uh, in terms of an Israeli bomb, is that whatever you think of the government of Iran, uh, and I certainly wouldn't want to be gay or a Sufi there right now, but you know, whatever you think, uh, it, it, it it certainly might shed insight into their behavior in pursuing a nuclear weapon to reflect on the fact yeah. that their adamant enemy in the region right, exactly. already possesses one, yeah. and maybe solving this problem in the long term involves some open discussion of that. Oh, man, because that's the point I made in the blog I wrote a week or so ago, because I, the, the, it may well be, it, 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 may, it certainly may be a part of the motivation for Iran to get try to get a bomb, which it claims it's not doing, but we all know that that's in the back seat. Right. And or it it, it is relevant to uh, Netanyahu's behavior in going ballistic, <laughs> to borrow a corny phrase. Right. Uh, right. Um, on the possibility that Iran will take away its nuclear superiority in the Middle East, which it doesn't admit having. Right. Right. No, that's a very good point. That's a yeah, very good point. And 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 you can go on from there. Um if I were active in the various political movements to ban nuclear weapons, period, everywhere, including the United States, which every once in a while an American president will say that's what we want to do too. Uh I would I would take this moment and say, Let's let's come clean, everybody, including the US. The US um, I, I, just for your your readers' reassurance, I love our country I, deeply, and I and I'm not being facetious about that. But that's what bothers me about its its hypocritical, if not duplicitous, role in some of these really big, scary issues. And so, this is an open opening. Not that I expect the current president or maybe the next three presidents to take it, but it's an opening. To, to really talk honestly to folks around the world about the realities. And that might lead to, a, you know, transforming politics, not just in Israel or the Middle East, but in the United States. So it's, it's, there's a lot at stake, potentially, and I, I don't want right. to... Right. And, and I do want to say... This, but, but, you know, this is the way things change, when, when suddenly the curveball comes in from somewhere... And people right. have to stop denying what they've what they've always pretended to to deny. Right. I, I, and I do have to say, uh, I agree with you on everything, including love for this country. But when it comes to seeing the change come from the Oval Office, I would say respectfully, don't hold your breath. But oh, uh, 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 but it may mean that this plus the shift uh, as a result of, of this week's election and American perception of yeah. May be an opening for a different kind of conversation and uh, all around, and and I think that could be very positive. Well, let's pivot in a, a few minutes we have left, though, if you don't mind, to domestic uh, politics a little bit. Um, you wrote a piece called "But Is Hillary Ready for Us?" and you talk a lot about what her advisors are now saying and the fact that uh, Larry Summers or whomever is now talking about inequality and the message is, you know. Uh, is is Hillary gets it, and you say, but this is not just inside baseball stuff. Uh, uh, what what's the gist? What what is your message about this change in tone, which some people find encouraging from the Clinton uh, team? Well, I think the larger context uh, is that the Democratic Party is in it is in a profound identity crisis. And I've been saying something like that for quite a while, as you know. I put it a little more sharply in the piece on on Hillary Clinton's movements to a, 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 a not I can't say to the left, but to a more open and recognizable 
understanding of where we are as a country, not to mention the world. And that is the deep economic uh, ruptures that are still upon us. And this is a subject you've gone over many times, I know. But Mm -hmm. there's still not an honest recognition from almost, with some honorable exceptions, uh, from politicians of the depth of of, uh, this continuing distortion and and breakdown of of American economic uh, promises that have been, you know, with us for decades, generations. So the question I see facing the Democratic Party in 2016, is it going to stick with the, the new Dems version of who they are, that is, you know, the financial friendly, deregulation, lots of other stuff, uh, which was done really in partnership with the Wall Street gurus like Robert Rubin, et cetera, et cetera. Or is the party going to break the new ground and recognize that the future doesn't look anything much like the past we have known? And we're not going to throw everybody out of with the bathwater but a political party has got to start speaking to that new reality. What what what's what what I describe now underway is is that the the the, the ready for Hillary machine is is open to courtship with the discontented Dems who feel like what I've just expressed, and um, some people whom I respect and admire, economists, take that very seriously when Larry. Summers says for his, for this and that, the labor movement, worker ownership, all this good stuff I, I and others have been talking about for more than a generation. Um, that's not bad. That's good. But I do well, have to say, you know, what we don't, we don't, we're not quite ready to to buy that package if, because it's very hard to believe that these people um, believe it themselves. It's a, you know, I think it's a strategic sort of modeling that they've they've worked out. My phrase, which I like, I'll repeat it for you, is the new Dems are now the old guard. Absolutely. And they and they and like most old guards, they are not gonna gracefully give up their power and influence. Well as or as I say, they still want a party like it's nineteen ninety nine. But right. uh, and, uh, and make us feel that way. <laughs> Right, and 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 I think you make a great point. And I guess we're, we're going to have to wrap up, but but I guess I would just conclude by saying, in terms of the shift, uh, uh, at least rhetorically and analytically among the new Dems, I, I guess this is a moment for behavioral modification from the rank and file to say, well, we like the rhetoric. Now keep giving us some action, and we will keep moving your way. Yeah. Well. Yes. I'm, yeah, well, I, I, I think some of us will argue among ourselves over whether that's even a plausible strategy. <laughs> well, I think that's true, too, but we'll have to save that yeah, for yeah. another day okay. because we're out of time. But William Grider, uh, thanks so much for joining us. As always, great pleasure to have you on the show. Same, same for me. Thanks. Bye. You bet. Uh, we will be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.